Good morning, and thank you for spending some time with us here this morning. Uh, I really appreciate it. I know everybody's busy, and I uh, appreciate you carving out a little bit of time for us here today. I also want to take an opportunity, I know I saw a couple of board members flying around, but I obviously want to take every opportunity I can to thank the Board of Trustees, because ultimately they are responsible for giving me the opportunity to serve you and this community. So I, I will forever be in the uh, debt of the Board of Trustees as well. And to you as a community, thank you, not just for welcoming me as a new leader in your community, but my entire family. We've had a very smooth uh, and very enjoyable transition into certainly the Augusta Prep community, but the greater Augusta Prep um, community as well. So thank you very much. And last, and certainly not least, thank you to my beautiful wife for being here uh, front row and center, very impressed. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here small days. Appreciate it. Okay, let's dive right in. I'm going to tackle five different areas. Jamie, are we we're moving? Yes, this is good. If you don't mind tying that down a little bit, Jamie, I appreciate it. We're going to tackle five different <coughs> areas this morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit, and I, I know I've mentioned uh, in a couple of different avenues, I've mentioned the charge today. I'm going to touch on that real briefly again this morning. We're then going to look at, uh, from an early assessment standpoint, what I see happening here at Augusta Prep. And I can go into a little more depth now than I was able to earlier in the school year. We're going to take a look at some vision casting. And really what that is is a preview to some of the strategic thinking or strategic planning that we're doing here on campus. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our finances. It, it's interesting to me in my experience in independent schools, the budget and the finances on an independent school campus are way too often a mystery. And there's really no need for that to be the case. We're going to talk a little bit of financial um, transparency here this morning. And then maybe most importantly for some of you, give you an opportunity to ask some questions here this morning. So can't wait to get to that part as well. So let's take a look. Charge to the head. When I refer to a charge to the head, the way I think about it is really twofold. Number one, it ultimately serves as my job description. So a charge to the head essentially is passed down from the Board of Trustees to me as a job description. And the second piece, the second thing it does for me, and the reason I'm sharing it with you here this morning, is it helps us as an entire community to stay focused. You would be amazed at the variety of things that come across my desk, and the variety of things that show up at my, at my door. In fact, I, I told multiple people this, so I apologize if it's redundant, but I am at some point going to write a book about the variety of things that come across my desk. And my biggest challenge in writing that book isn't going to be coming up with the stories, because they are a plenty. The challenge I'll have in writing that book is convincing a publisher to keep it on the nonfiction list. <laughs> so it's really important to me that I have a guide handed down from the Board of Trustees to keep me focused. And it's one of the big reasons I want to make sure that you as a community are well aware of what that charge to the head looks like. Where are we focused? Because I guarantee there will be times when you come and talk to me, whether it's at a game in my office, at a play, if something's really important to you, something's incredibly passionate to you and important to our community, but it doesn't quite fit where we're headed right now. So rarely will you hear no, but you may hear not yet. And that's because we have our site set very specifically on five different areas. And really the first three, as you can see, the first three have a great deal to do with the fact that we are in a leadership transition. And typically in independent schools, leadership transitions are not events. My leadership transition didn't happen July 1st when I started the job. It didn't happen the first day of school. Leadership transitions range. Sometimes they're one to three years, sometimes three to five years. I certainly hope five years from now I still don't feel like I'm transitioning to the Augusta Prep community, but it's not an event, it's a, it's a process. And it has a lot to do with immersing myself into the culture of our community, understanding who we are as a school, understanding our traditions and our culture, who we are. The relationship piece, I think, is pretty obvious. If I'm going to be an effective leader in this community, I need to build trust. I talk a lot about bank accounts. And I don't mean the financial ones necessarily, but the emotional ones. And I need to make a great deal of deposits, a great number of deposits, into the emotional bank account of our community, because I know there will be days I need to make some withdrawals as well. So that's about building relationships and building trust. And the third piece, Certainly it's important during a transition, but I would say it's important across the board. Communication is so incredibly important, which, interestingly, is <coughs> what we're doing this morning. And I'm a big believer that communication is a two-way street. 
So I know a lot of people who are good at talking, good at presenting, and can consider themselves good communicators. And that's important, yes. But we've got two ears and one mouth. And I like to use them in that ratio. So we need to listen as much as we need to talk. We are going to touch a little bit on the strategic plan and our process, what we're doing with the strategic plan. So that's certainly a big piece of the expectation for me this morning. Where are we going to get to with the strategic plan? What's it going to look like? What's going to be included? You'll get a bit of a preview here this morning. And then that last piece, as most of you are aware, um, and I thank Dr. Chambers. Where is Dr. Chambers? I know he's in here somewhere. Uh, Dr. Chambers is doing a phenomenal job as our inner upper school head this year. But we are in the process of finding a permanent upper school head. I don't know if you've thought about it, I certainly have, but this year's senior class, unfortunately, next year's senior class will have four upper school heads in their high school career. That's tough. It's really tough. It's not okay. So we're addressing that in the search. We are down, just so you know, we're down to seven finalists <coughs> in that search. Pretty impressive group. We are, about a week's time, we're going to do some Skype interview with that group. And we will get to the point where probably early November, mid-November at the latest, we will have a couple of finalists that join us here on campus, uh, preferably with their families. And we can, at that point, select who we're going to have join us permanently in the upper school office. Uh, so thank you, Jerry, for all your good stuff. Uh, it's been a joy. Thank you. Okay, so that's the charge of the job description, what we're focused on. I mentioned we were going to talk about an early assessment. And again, I, I mentioned some things along the way. But I'm going to get to be, uh, into a little more detail with you this morning. In a general sense, my early assessment is that Augusta Prep is a really good school. And I know to an extent I'm probably preaching to the choir. And I've had experience at really good schools. I've had some experience at schools that maybe aren't so great. So I feel like I have a good sense of what a good school looks like versus a broken school. And I am here to tell you this morning, this is anything but a broken school. That's a great number of things happen. So you can take my word for it and say, okay, we checked that box, we're a great school. Or some of you may want some numbers to back that up. So I have something for you this morning. I'm going to get through the uh, four pieces I'm going to talk about. Some of the data, some of the numbers. The average SAT score coming out of Augusta Prep at this point is 1825. The state of Georgia is under 1500. The average ACT score coming out of Augusta Prep, 27. Across the state of Georgia, 21. Last year, when you look at all the AP exams that our high school students took, 94.5% of those exams scored a three or higher on the AP exam, which in some realm is referred to as a passing grade. That's pretty impressive, 94.5%. Typically at an independent day school like ours, that is a very good school, doing things really well, you'll typically see a number of 75, 80, sometimes 85%. 94.5% is off the charts. That's pretty impressive. Flip the switch a little bit. We've got 86% of our kids, 7th through 12th grade, that are participating in at least one co-curricular activity. So yes, we're doing some really important stuff in the classroom, but a lot of growth, as you all know, a lot of growth happens outside of the classroom as well. 86% participating in at least one. This next statistic is, is as important to me as dad as it is at the school. We have 27% diversity on our campus. That is another number that is off the charts when you consider that we are a small independent day school in the southeastern United States and we have 27% diversity. That's impressive. That's the kind of world that Betsy and I want our boys to grow up in. And then I think about enrollment. There are a few qualifiers to whether you're a good school or not than enrollment. That's essentially you as a community voting your confidence in us as a school. We have 553 students on campus, and our three-year running average for opening day enrollment is 555. So I'd say we're hitting our target pretty well. I said we're going to get into finances a little bit, and we will. But what that means, when you're hitting that target number enrollment-wise, it means that you're a financially stable school. Doesn't mean we have packets of money tucked away, but it means we're a financially stable school. It means that we can answer the call when it comes to programming and otherwise. And that'll make a little more sense when we talk about some of the finances. Staying on enrollment for a moment, 
The other thing that's happening across the country is the attrition rate, so the number of students that leave independent day schools is increasing. The national average used to hover around 9.5%, 10%. It's climbing to 11, and across the country, I believe at this point, it's closer to 12%. So here we are in Augusta, Georgia, which is a fairly transient community, particularly when you consider the military influence. And we're 9% attrition. So we are under the national average in attrition, which again is a huge vote of confidence for families here at Augusta Prep. And to pick that number apart a little bit further, this is the part I really like, when we separate the families who have simply moved away from Augusta Prep, so really didn't have a choice not to come back, we're down to 5% attrition. So families that stay in town and have the option to be here at Augusta Prep, only 5% are choosing not to return. That's a pretty impressive number. I mentioned the financial stable piece, and again, simply means that we have the opportunity to answer the call. We have the opportunity to answer the mission that we have as a school. We have the opportunity to do the things that we need to do to make sure that your children are in the best care possible, educationally and otherwise. The other thing that is really attractive to me as a school leader is this whole idea of growth mindset. So I stepped into the community here at Augusta Prep, and what I discovered pretty quickly is that across the board, we have what I would refer to as a growth mindset. And all that really means is we don't have our heels dug in. We're not fighting change. We're not willing to look outside of ourselves. If you're stuck in that moment, you have the opposite of a growth mindset. So here what I'm finding at PrEP is that our faculty and our staff are willing to embrace challenges. They're willing to take a look at change as long as there's a justifiable reason for it and we think it's going to make us better as a school. Our faculty and staff are willing to take risks. There are very few organizations that are more risk averse, typically, than schools. And what I'm finding with the growth mindset here on campus is we're willing to take that risk because what we are willing, willing to realize is that through mistakes, and they're going to be made, I promise you that. I'll make very few promises this morning. That's what I will do. We are going to make mistakes. But that's how we grow. You've probably heard me say it before, and you'll hear me say it again. One of the most important roles that we play as educators in the lives of your children is that of a role model. So I think about Oliver. Oliver's in pre-K over here in the lower school. And I think about the amount of growth that we've already seen in him this year. It's hard for me to conceptualize the growth we're going to see in that little guy by the time he graduates from growth. So it makes no sense for me as an educator or to reflect on our faculty as educators, that we also shouldn't be growing. That's what we do <coughs> professionally. We help your children <coughs> grow. So my theory is we should also be growing. And one of the ways your kids and mine grow is by making mistakes. So it's this whole risk averse issue, which I have not found to the extent here at PrEP that I frankly would have guessed coming in the door. So we're going to talk a little bit more about why I think that is here. My fourth point when I think about an early assessment and trying to identify how and why we are in such a good school today is our faculty. We as a school community, you as a school community, for the last three to four years have been through what I would refer to as some leadership turmoil. There has not been a consistent presence in the head of school's office. I already mentioned the upper school head's office and even the college council. There has been leadership turnover in those three key positions. That, I can tell you, is very, very difficult on a school community. So one of the assessments I've used when I look at our faculty, and not just the upper school, middle and lower as well, is the fact that they have done such a phenomenal job over that three to four year stretch of protecting your children from the turmoil, sheltering them from it to an extent, and maintaining the quality, academically and otherwise, that Augusta Prep has known. And our faculty deserve 100% of the credit for doing so. So that alone tells me that we've got some great people on campus. We've got people that are passionate about what they do and dedicated to their work. And your kids are their work. So to me, that's a huge assessment in a positive column of 
what we've got on campus for faculty and staff. Okay, I told you we were going to do a little bit of a preview uh, in terms of strategic planning and vision and where I am. Vision is an interesting thing. Um, as I mentioned, I've had some experience at some, some high quality schools and I can bring that experience to you. It's really difficult early in a transition when I'm still learning a great deal about our community to stand up and say, definitively, here's the vision, this is exactly where we're going, this is what the next 10 years are going to look like. In my opinion, the whole idea of strategic thinking, strategic planning, is an ongoing process. I'd be a fool to stand up here today and tell you I know exactly what it's going to look like five years down the road. But what I am confident to do this morning is to talk a little bit about three specific areas where I feel like, again, we are in good shape. I want to make sure I reiterate that point as many times as I need to this morning. We are in really good shape in these three areas. But there's also room, room for growth. And we can debate, <coughs> debate amongst yourselves, we can debate during the Q&A session the order in which these should be presented in terms of two and three. But number one, we're not going to argue. And I can't imagine anybody here would want to argue. Our people, and I mentioned our faculty a moment ago, our people, faculty and staff on this campus, are by far the most important aspect of what we do every day. You can have a great school, and your buildings are a shambles, and nobody knows what the curriculum looks like. You can still have a great school if you've got all the right people. I'm not suggesting we're not going to know what the curriculum looks like, or the buildings are going to be a shambles. But we start with the people. And as I mentioned, we've got some great ones on campus. So specifically the two areas, when I think strategically, when I think down the road, where can we grow, what can we do to invest in our people? The two big areas that come to mind are compensation. We need to make sure that the great work, the dedication, the passion that I've mentioned to you this morning is being rewarded. Compensation, which is salary, it's benefits, it's all kinds of other things. We need to make sure that we're on par there and that we're honoring the work that's being done here on this campus. And then professional development is a huge piece as well. I'm a big believer in professional development. We do some, but we don't do enough. And we're going to make plans to invest in our people for professional development as well. These next two, I'm going to put them both up on the screen. The beauty of technology, look at that. So these are the two that I said we can debate a little bit about which goes first. It doesn't really matter to me. I just know they're both really important. We need to invest in our programming. And here's an important point for you this morning. When I use that term, programming, <coughs> It's certainly our academic programming, our curriculum, what's happening in the classroom, no question. But it goes well beyond that. Our programming is our co-curricular program. Our programming is our after-school program. So when I use that term programming, it's a, it's a fairly wide, fairly large umbrella. And we need to invest in all of our programs. Some specifics, we need to take a look at 21st century skills on our campus, technology integration. 21st century skills is an interesting one. It's kind of been a buzzword, maybe it's the right term to use, the last five to ten years in the world of education. The first step for us is to define, to define what that means to us. When we talk about 21st century skills, what does that mean? Everybody's got a different idea. There's all kinds of research out there. And we're going to hone in on and define what we mean by 21st century skills. And I think it's interesting, when you whether you read Tony Wagner's work or anybody else, and, and like Tony Wagner, for instance, he's got a book called The Global Achievement Gap. It's, it's one of my personal favorites in terms of 21st century skills. He lays out seven, I think he calls it the seven essential 21st century skills. And what's really interesting to me is that most of those, John Dewey was talking about 150 years ago, too. So this whole idea of 21st century skills versus skills that are important for kids to know, I, I don't know where we all fall there, but nonetheless, we need to define what that term means for us as a school community and then do it. And I think as we're doing these kind of assessments, what we're going to find is that a lot of it's already happened. Is it purposefully weaved into our curriculum in the ways that we can going forward? Maybe not yet. But a lot of it is happening in here because, again, we've got great people in the class. I talk about student leadership and character. One of the most important programming pieces in my opinion, in independent schools, and therefore one of the most important reasons that Betsy and I will always have our boys involved in independent schools is this whole idea of role modeling that I mentioned and mentoring. So when I think about leadership and I think about character, some of that can be weaved into a curriculum. But I think, for the most part, correct me if I'm wrong, 
one of the most important things, one of the most important reasons that you send your children to us every day is that you want to know at the end of the day that at least one, and I would argue here at Graham, it's probably a lot more than one, but at least one adult knows, cares for, and loves your child on their hands. And one of the most important ways to make that happen, in my opinion, is to have a really strong advisory program. So classroom teachers can build those kind of relationships, yes. But we're going to move to an advisory program. There's already a fairly strong program that Melody has set up in the middle school. We're using that as a bit of a benchmark. And we're going to have a strong advisory program all the way through the upper school. So that, number one, you have a contact. You have a liaison on campus that you know, know intimately. From an education standpoint, emotional standpoint, social standpoint, know your child. And that's where the leadership and character development can really happen, can really blossom for our, our students. And then schedules and calendars. Uh, I've mentioned finances a couple times, and we will talk about that, I promise. It's interesting to me, um, when I step in to a school community, whether it's Augusta Prep or any other, if I ask for two pieces of information, and about 10 minutes, maybe 15, depending on how complicated the budget is, I can report to you where a school's priorities lie. I need to see their daily schedule, and I need to see their budget. And based on those two pieces of information, I can tell you where a school's priorities lie. Now they can, that school can have all the fancy marketing materials they want, and the, the most glowing mission statement, and all that stuff, that's all well and fine. But in my opinion, it's your budget and your schedule that truly dictates what's important to you as a school. And we need to look at our schedule. We need to put a schedule in place that does two things, makes the most effective use of the resources we have, whether that be teachers, whether that be actual money, program, whatever it happens to be, and we also need to make sure that our schedule dictates to us, to our community, what our priorities are as a school. And if we put that test in place and we're not quite there yet, then I'm okay with making changes to our schedule. I know there have been a lot of changes to our schedule. Faculty are here rolling their eyes at me, but we are going to change it as many times as we need to until it communicates what our priorities are. And then facilities, and again, two and three, you could argue one goes before the other. Our facilities, it, it, it's a real easy and quick assessment for me. When I walk through the halls, whether it's in the upper school, middle school, or lower school, here at Augusta Prep, what I try to do as much as I can, I know for a fact, because I know the people, I know the curriculum, I know what's happening, I know for a fact that our academic programming is impressive. You've heard the numbers. I mean, it, it's, it's, very impressive stuff that's happening here. But in my opinion, our facilities do not match the quality of our education. Our facilities do not match the quality of our academic program on our campus. Which to me says that we've got some work to do. There's already been talk in the community over the last several years as there have been bits and pieces of a strategic plan put together. A lot of talk about our science facilities. And I couldn't agree more that our science facilities need to be upgraded and expanded. Without question. But in my mind, it doesn't stop at science. All of our academic space needs to be updated and improved. So that surely will, will pan out in terms of a master plan on our campus over X number of years. We will be making the improvements we need to honor the great work that's already happening on our campus from a facility standpoint. <coughs> okay, I mentioned that finances are way too often, in my opinion, a mystery. So we're going to talk a little bit. BJ, are you okay? PJ's a little nervous right now. He's got to revoke my hands and I'm going to talk about finances, but we're going to be okay, I promise. I'm going to throw all this up as well and we'll talk through it. I don't fully understand why finances are so often mystery in schools, but they won't be here. I get that for what it's worth. Um, start off the, off the top. We have an endowment here at Augusta Prep of about five and a half million dollars. The vast majority of that is specifically earmarked for several different categories, some of which I put up here, professional development, financial aid, obviously is a big one. So that's not like a pot of money, you know, that hey, we want to build a $5 million building. Well, great, let's use the endowment. It doesn't work that way. This is money that's put aside to help over the long haul the history of our school in very specific areas. But it's helping. The average endowment for a school our size in the southeast is actually a little bit lower than five. So we're, we're on target. And there's certainly work to be done there, and we will still see growth there, I'm quite certain. But we are very, again, very solid, very good in $5.5 million endowment. 
This number may surprise some of you, it may not. But our operating budget, which is $80 million, 75% of it goes directly into our people. You've already heard me say we, we may need to increase that. The 75%, it's a pretty big jump. <coughs> the money that's generated through tuition revenue and otherwise goes directly back to our people, salaries and benefits. It does not include professional development. Coverage. Professional development is a separate piece. So if you argue that professional development was part of salary compensation investing in our people, that number would actually be higher. Here's another interesting one that quite often garners some questions. 88% of our annual expenses are covered by the tuition revenue that comes in. And often, one of the questions that that's asked is, well, why don't we just make it 100%? Well, that's because we would then need to add 12% roughly to your tuition bill. And what that would do, in some cases, frankly, that, that would be okay. You would probably still see the tuition come in. But in a lot of cases, what that would do is price a good percentage of our families out of the market. We would become smaller as a school. We would become less diverse as a school. And neither of those are okay. This is a very typical model in independent day schools, where anywhere between 8 and 15 percent represents a gap between tuition revenue and actual <coughs> expenses for a school. So we are right there where we should be. Well, what it means is we have a 12% gap. <coughs> we have auxiliary programming. We have other uh, tools in place. We do quite a bit of facility rental here on campus. And that helps make up the gap. But by far, the number one piece that makes it up is our annual fund, as you can imagine. You've seen all the literature. You know how that works. That's why we need your help to make up that gap. Because again, it's a 12% difference between the money that comes in through tuition revenue and the actual cost to run our school. To deliver the programming that we do, to provide you with the people that we do, it's a 12% gap. And that's where we are as a, as a school financially. Okay, so really quickly in summary, and then I, I do want to open up the questions. What you've heard me say this morning, I hope, is that again, we are a very good school. There are a lot of wonderful things happening. It doesn't mean there's not room for growth. We have a growth mindset. But we are a very good school. The way very good schools operate, it's kind of like a three legged stool, if you think about it. If you need a visual this morning, it's like a three legged stool. One of the legs holding up that stool is us, faculty, staff, here at Augusta Prep. The second leg of that stool is the student themselves. Students need to participate in their own education. They need to learn how to self-advocate for themselves. They need to learn how to participate, whether it's in a group project or otherwise. So the student is a really important leg of that stool. And the third leg of the stool is you. Without involvement from you as our community, and specifically as our families, we cannot be successful in school. So simply your participation here this morning is a great sign of you participating in the lives of your children. I'm going to give you another example so you can kind of earmark this on your calendar. I saw Ms. Hudson came in. You may know the exact date, but I know in March we're going to have a group called the Freedom for Chemical Dependency is going to come to campus. It's a group I've worked with at other schools, and they're phenomenal. They are here to educate your children on what's currently happening out there in the world of drugs and alcohol. Hopefully to an extent, scare them a little bit, because the people they bring, the FCD group, they actually bring former addicts who are now fully re rehabilitated. But these are people that literally know what it's like to wake up and crack. So they can be very real with our kids. And that's powerful stuff. And I think it was two years ago, was it, Ms. Hudson, that we had a um, family and evening activity associated with FCD so that you could hear some of what was being shared with your children. But here's the other important piece that FCD does. They're also going to share with us at an evening program, <clears throat> share with you what they're hearing our kids on our campus say to them. And guess how many people showed up? It was two years ago, I think it was, that we did that program for adults. For two. You must have wanted to. We had two families show up. And I know there's a lot going on. I get that. But we need your participation to be an effective educational community. 
So is that financial annual fund? Absolutely. We need you to participate. We need your help. But it's deeper than that. It's more than that. We need you to participate in every aspect of the lives of your kids. Whether it's sharing something with us that's going on at home, asking a question. We love good news. We hear the opposite sometimes as well. We love the good news. <coughs> But open up those lines of communication because I promise you we stand ready to do the same of our own. Okay, I want to know what you think. I want to know what questions you have. I want to know what you're hearing out there. And you may want some actual data. Can you imagine that actual data attached to some of the things you're hearing? So please, yes. Yeah,
Uh, we will, <clears throat> in three years' time, be paying off our last existing bond. So we have that budgeted already. We have a $300,000 payment to make over the next two years, and then a $400,000 balloon payment to make to finish that bond issue. And we will then be debt free. In terms of facilities, um, there's been a lot, especially with the price and cost, the price of money these days, a lot of schools taking out a great deal of debt to build, which on some level makes sense. We actually have, it's built right into our bylaws at the board level, so it's not even just about my philosophy. I happen to agree with it, but it's built right into our board bylaws that we will not build a building without raising the money for that building first. And we go beyond that. We actually build in a percentage above and beyond the cost of the building to put into an endowment, a, a similar endowment. I'm not talking about the same endowment we, we mentioned this morning, but a, a fund to then pay some of the maintenance on that building. Because the schools get themselves in trouble there too. You raise money to build a building and oh yeah, we had to factor cleaning it, maintaining it, air conditioning units, all the other stuff that goes with it. So we actually build in a percentage above and beyond the cost of the building before we put it on. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, sir. Along those same lines, and this might be a question that is better answered by the board, what specific initiatives or plans are there to grow the endowment you spoke of? It, 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 it's a fair question to ask in the board. We haven't, frankly, since I've arrived in July, and had that conversation. I think, <clears throat> admittedly, there are, because we're helping, we're certainly not done in that avenue with our endowment at five and a half million, but because we are helping, I think there are other priorities, quite frankly. But I think for the long term, <coughs> stability and sustainability as, as a school, we need to grow that as well. So I don't mean that it's never going to happen. But I do think from a facility standpoint, from a capital, we use the term capital. Capital means when you raise money for buildings, typically, and or your time. So, so big dollars are those items. Uh, from a capital perspective, I would argue at this point, our priority is some facility, either renovation and or building. And then the next natural step will be to focus more on the event. But we are, because we're healthy, it's not, there's no emergency attached with that. that makes sense. Anyone else? Can you yes. talk a little about your philosophy about the curriculum, specifically the AP offerings and positioning our kids to be competitive as they apply to college? Sure. Um, in terms of curriculum and, and academics in whole, I think one of the things we talked about 21st century skills, one of the things that we need to focus on as a school community is not so much changing what we teach, because guess what, we do a pretty good job of teaching history and math and science and you name it. So, looking forward, I don't see us changing what we teach, but I do think we need to take a pretty hard look at how we teach it. That's where the 21st century skills comes in, that's where the technology integration comes in. So, I don't want to do anything to take away from the quality of education that students are leaving Augusta Prep with. But I do want to make sure that we're, as I mentioned, infusing skills that are applicable both in college and beyond along the way as well. So academically, that's what I really focus on, is how are we teaching, what pedagogy is being used more than the curriculum itself. The curriculum is, is, as I can already tell, very solid. Now, when it comes to specific items like AP programs, AP obviously is a, is a very well-known, AP and IB are both well-known uh, products when it comes to applying to colleges. And I don't, in the near future, foresee any changes there. Here at Augusta Prep. I will say one of the discussions that we will have internally and academically as we're assessing who we are academically, one of the things we are going to have to look at is the number of high quality schools across the country, private schools, independent schools, that are going away from AP. And in their mind, doing things that are above and beyond the AP program. Uh, again, I don't foresee that happening here, certainly in the short term, but it has to be part of our discussion. Why are they doing it? How would it benefit us or not? And if so, what would it look like? So we, we will have that discussion, but I don't, I don't mean to scare anybody and to suggest that we're going to make a change to eliminate AP programs next month. That's not going to happen. Yes, I've never had a child graduate yet from prep or apply to college, but I've heard from more experienced parents that sometimes our students are at a disadvantage because it's so much harder to get an A right. in high school to get some prep versus students who are applying for the same positions in college. I can imagine. Thank you for asking me. Um, this is one of my favorite, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, pieces of bad information, maybe, that are flying around town. So I will share with you exactly what's happening there. 
um, both kind of anecdotally in terms of preparation for college and statistically in terms of getting into it. And I will ask, if we take nothing else away from today's presentation, please share this with at least three people because there is so much bad information out there. Um, Ivy Harrison, who I referenced earlier, Ivy is our new college counselor who joined us this summer as well. One of the very first things that she and I did this summer uh, after arriving on campus was take a trip to UGA uh, and to meet the brass at UGA to tell them a little bit about who we are as a school and to make sure that we were building a relationship with them so that we can be in the best position possible to advocate for your students, whether it's at UGA or any other college. And as you can imagine, we asked some pretty pointed questions while we were on campus. So what I typically hear is something along the lines of, why would I spend the money to send my children to Augusta Prep when I could go to, doesn't matter, name a school, specifically public school, and stand at least as good, if not a better chance of getting in to UGA. UGA is the one that cited the most, but it, it's, it's applicable to a lot of schools. And I can answer that question for you two ways. Number one, if you send your children to Augusta Prep to get them into UGA or any other school, you're doing it wrong. That's not what we do. We don't get your kids into college, whether it's a specific college or any college. What we do is prepare your children to be the most successful student sitting in their health class when they get to college. Now, we happen to have an expert, two experts. Where's Marsha? Marsha's here too. We have two experts on campus whose jobs are solely to help your children find what we refer to as a good fit. There are over 5,000 accredited colleges in the country. And I guarantee that there are plenty that Ben's going to be a good fit for. It may not be UGA. Even if four generations have gone to UGA, that might not be the best fit. So we're not here to get your kids into UGA or any other college, but we're here to help them find a good fit, and then most importantly, get them prepared to be the most successful person there, to be the person on the hall who's tutoring all the other kids who don't know how to run. That's what we're doing here. So in terms of preparation, that's the focus. Now, statistically, do you stand a better chance going elsewhere to get into UGA? Well, I can tell you this. Over the last five years, and Ivy ran all the numbers for me, so we've got all the information. Over the last five years of applicants from Augusta Prep to UGA, I'll use that as an example, 63% of our applicants get into UGA. From all the other schools, their, their stated admission rate is below 50. So there alone, our kids stand a better chance just because they're coming from Augusta Prep. Is it harder to make an A at Augusta Prep than it is at the new name of school? I hope. It should be, and I'm sure it is. I know that. You know that. We all know the kids know that. But guess what? UGA knows that, too. That's the part that people sometimes don't believe. But UGA knows what a 3.8 for instance coming out of the prep, what that means relative to 3.8. 3.8 coming out of another school, they know that. So it is 100% false. Whether you look at it from uh, a philosophical standpoint, our job is not to get you into college, our job is to prepare you for college, or if you look at it from a statistical standpoint, 63% versus sub 50%, <coughs> it is false that you stand less of a chance of getting into UGA or you name college. <coughs> when you send your kids to prep. It's actually the opposite. And nobody knows that. Nobody believes that. And I just want to follow up by saying parents have also said to me that they're so well prepared. The first year is easy. The way ahead of their peers. Yep. We hear it all the time. Anecdotally, but it, it, it pans out too because that's our focus. That's what we do. We don't get your kids into college. Your kids <coughs> get themselves into college. We just happen to make sure that they're prepared for that. I went through a transition when I've told the story several times. Um, I went to a large public school and I got passed through. I don't think I ever got anything below like an 80% of anything. I graduated with honors, but I didn't do any work. I didn't know how to advocate for myself. I didn't know how to study. I certainly didn't know how to write. So I go to college as a history major and I write my first history paper for Dr. Fish. I will never forget her for multiple reasons. One of them being the fact that I got my first history paper back as a freshman in college and I got a 47. Never forget that 47. And that told me a lot of things. The first of which, I was not prepared. I went to a big public high school. I got pushed through. I was an athlete. You know, I, I, I spent more time talking about the previous night's game in that class than I did math, which is why I had to marry a math teacher. 
<laughs> so, yeah, we prepare kids. And then we help them, they stand a better chance of getting in, and they're better prepared. So if you're thinking about investment, is it worth the investment? It's pretty hard to argue it's not. Good question, Jay. Oh, yes, sir. Um, are there plans? Uh, to have more of a gifted type of education uh, or classes for the lower school and middle school, which seems to be um, a gap between, you know, private schools and good public schools at that <coughs> level. I think, you know, in the high schools, the AP program, you know, closes the gap. When, when it comes to middle and lower school, we seem to see that gap kind of omnipresent. When you say gifted programs, meaning like a pull-up program. Pull-up program or, you know, or, you know, moving them into a next grade and giving them the option. Well, I mean, certainly in independent schools, there are certainly children that advance grade levels, like skip grades, for instance. I mean, that, that certainly happens. I mean, it's not a philosophical goal, necessarily, unless it's a school. I think, and if this doesn't answer your question, this may be a conversation we need to have offline with, with Mary Beth. Um, but I would answer simply here this morning by saying, I hope we don't have a need for pull-up programs for the gifted children very often in that we are able to differentiate in our classrooms that are so small and in the real lower grades with two teachers. We have the opportunity to do things there that you don't when you have 35 kids in the classroom, which necessitate, necessitates the pull-up. So if that's, if that's what you're referring to, I, I frankly, I hope we don't have a need for it because I hope whether it's, and it would not be mine, but whether it's my children or not, if they need an extra push, if they need more challenge, we are able to do that within the context of a differentiated program, much more so here than it would be in a much bigger classroom that you typically find in the public system. But if that, if that doesn't get to the heart of it, we can help the we can the Sure. Anyone else? The bell doesn't necessarily mean you need to stop. <laughs> that wasn't for us. Yes, I just please. want to make a little uh, team went to Logansville, and I just want to applaud our school. Uh, volleyball team, non-contact sport. We don't expect bad things to happen. Um, between tennis and golf, I don't know if there's a more non-contact sport. Um, anyway, I'll try to make this brief, and, and I do have a point to it, is um, a girl was standing on the court, not our girl, one of the Loganville um, uh, players, and just fell out, eyes rolled back and fell out. My assessment was a grand mal seizure, that's what we were about to see. We saw nothing. She flatlined in total cardiac arrest for over three and a half minutes. CPR <coughs> was being done, they operated beautifully. I mean, they were totally textbook at Logan Bell. Um, our girls thought the girl was dehydrated. Okay, CPR was convincing. CPR does nothing in a total cardiac arrest. They brought out the, a the AED machines. They did shock her. She was revived. They put in an internal, an internal defibrillator at Emory a couple of days later. I only tell you this because, you know, we read about them in the paper. Somebody dies on the field, you know, kid had no idea. She had no symptoms. She was not a cardiac patient. No known symptoms. Here's a healthy 17-year-old. I just implore you to know where those AED machines are. It's real. We watched it happen. And I will tell you, Carla Owen and I both looked at each other and said, we're going to watch this little girl die. We didn't, but I implore you, when Tammy Lee does those in services, listen, no, it's real, it happens. Parents, ask where those boxes were. There were two parents and a coach that ran the code. That's who ran the code. We have lots of medical people, but if we don't have an AED machine, we'd have had, she'd have never made it. So I, I, I just said it because there's a lot of rumors flying around, a lot of people were talking about it. But I want to say hats off to Tammy Lee because we have those machines, but if we don't know where they are, it doesn't do us any good. So I just implore faculty and staff and parents, ask, know, and we can be prepared too and have our students Hopefully, 